Welcome everyone. My name is Gary Gordon and I'm the founder and CEO of What Should I Be? Uh, for more information about What Should I Be, just visit our website at whatshouldibe.me. Uh, we produce and provide uh, information and video interviews from people all over the world that are doing things that they love and want to share it with you in the hopes that if you want to follow in their footsteps and do something similar, you'll be able to uh, listen to what they have to say, what their lives are like. And uh, we're here today with Steve Lowy, who has, uh, I think, a very uh, unique business that he started. And uh, we're going to talk about what Steve did, how he got started, what he did in high school, he went to college and so forth, and what led him up to where he got started through where he is today. Um, he's also a very young man at this time. So, Steve, um, you're in the picture right now. Why don't you uh, tell us just a, a very little brief bit about um, how you came up with the idea and what the name of the business is that you started, how you came up with it, maybe what led up to it. Um, again, with the aspect of if somebody was looking to try to start a, a similar type of business somewhere in the world, um, how would they get started and what, you know, what would take them through that same type of process? Sure. Um, well, I, uh, um, studied hospitality and tourism at university. Um, and whilst I was there, um, I, and before university I'd worked and traveled a bit. I really wanted to go traveling after university. Um, when I left the UK, I traveled around Southeast Asia for four months by bus and I was staying in $1 a night guest houses, uh, that offered the most amazing experience. Um, I loved food. I trained as a chef and they, you know, particularly in Vietnam, they would take me and have the street food and, you know, I would have tea with a grandma in the guest house. I got a real experience of what that city was about. And where did you go with these? Uh, where did you go when you went and lived in these houses? Like what countries or was it? Uh, went to uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, Thailand, Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, and, and I traveled everywhere by bus. And how did you make arrangements to find those houses? Uh, I just rocked up to those cities or towns, got off the bus and found somewhere. I had a Lonely Planet guide and a, and a friend, <laughs> uh, now, but it's 2003. Now, when you went to college, you got a degree in hospitality. Is that what you said? That's correct. Hospitality and tourism. Hospitality and tourism. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't, uh, here in the States, I don't usually hear of that degree that often. Um, yeah. Is that a common degree out in the UK? Um, it's, it's, they often, um, it's probably like your, uh, majors and minors where you study hospitality and then uh, at the university I went to, it was either and tourism and, uh, leisure, um, and food science. So it allowed you to specialize and, and learn about different things. I was always quite fascinated when I was at high school and did geography about tourism generally about how it affects countries and, and how it can be done in a more responsible manner. Okay. So you went and you got your degree. Yeah. Um, but back in high school, what things did you, you know, go through and so forth that, that you helped you identify that this was your, something that you had an interest in, the tourism? Okay. I mean, I think there's, there's a few positives and a few negatives in terms of, I came to find out that tourism was it. I mean, I think from the age of six, I loved food and cooking. Okay. Hospitality side. Um, I, when I was about six, my mom was cooking gravy, very British Sunday roast, and I hated lumps in the gravy. And while she wasn't looking, I got the sieve and I started taking it out and she saw me and she was quite upset. But then she said, do you want to learn how to cook? So I did. Um, my grandma was from Austria and when she came over from, uh, during the war, she actually opened her own little restaurant uh, in London and she, she loved food and she loved cooking. So I, I learned from her as well, my mother, and even my dad trained as a chef when he was much younger. So I've always had food in my blood. I've been really fortunate to live in somewhere like London where it's so ethnically diverse that you get to taste lots of different foods. Um, so all the way from when I was young, I've always loved that side of it. And um, uh, when I, I used to play quite high level soccer or football, um, not professional level, but sort of semi-professional. And, um, got to a stage where I realized I wasn't going to be the best. Um, I was fortunate enough to have traveled a bit with sports. I played water polo 
um, for my school and we were national champions and we went to Australia and New Zealand when I was 16 years old, which was a phenomenal experience. And that travel, particularly that trip, really gave me the bug for, I guess, travel and tourism. Um, during our A-levels, which is your sort of senior, I think, senior level at high school, um, you choose three subjects. I did maths, economics and geography. And in geography, tourism was my favourite part of it, um, which I learned a lot about, uh, looking at both positive and negative uh, effects. Um, and from there, I just really, really enjoyed talking and learning about it. I found, I find the world a fascinating place and all different ethnic cultures fascinating um, from a food level, but just generally immersing yourself in those cultures. Okay, so um, you were... At what level in high school at this particular point would you say senior, junior? Uh, I was 16 years old, so oh. senior I would be. You're a 16, senior yeah. at 16? I don't, I, don't, I don't know how your high school oh, is. Okay, because over here, I guess most of us get into high school when we're maybe about 15, 16. Oh, okay. And so that's, yeah, when we so become, that's when we become a freshman at that point here in the U.S. Okay. So we do our last two years of, of high of school or before college between 16 and 18. So... Okay. Uh, so yeah, so I started studying for my what is equivalent to your SATs when I was sixteen, and it's a two-year study. Right, period. right, right. And I immediately started learning about tourism. Then, just a quick question: When you say you studied for your SATs for two years, it's a course or something that you went through? I was just very curious. No, the schooling system here is you you do um, when you're sixteen, you do exams called GCSEs, and that is twelve or thirteen. I did. 14, but you do a uh, minimum nine subjects. Uh, you do your maths, your English, your sciences, and then you have electives. So you choose certain languages, you choose certain arts subjects. Right. I did right. uh, ceramics. Um, I can't draw, uh, but I can make things with my hand. Uh, and then when you go to A-level stage, which I guess you finish when you're 18, so those are the qualifications you need to go to university. Okay. That you uh, you choose three or four subjects. Okay. And I chose maths, geography, and economics. So when you were about sixteen, you kind of found that you were enjoying the tourism and traveling and geography and so forth. Yeah. And so that led you to make a decision to go into college for that same type of hospitality and tourism career. That's correct. Yeah, very much so. I enjoyed traveling and I also enjoyed learning about travel so okay so you went through that for like is it like four years uh it was a three-year course but I took uh, a gap year which I know is not quite as common in the states it's where you take a year out before you go to university okay uh, and I actually wanted to work in the industry to see if I enjoyed it or not that's great um which I think was important because if you're going to study it for three years you should enjoy it so yeah, yeah. I started off as a $2 an hour waiter uh, in a French restaurant near the Royal Courts of Justice in the centre of London. And within about 8 to 12 weeks, I was assistant manager uh, running the restaurant most of the time uh, and looking after all the events and parties there. From that, I actually earned enough money to go and do a bit of backpacking myself at an early age. And I went to Hong Kong and Thailand. Right. And then I interrailed around Europe with two friends where we got our interrail tickets, which is 30 days unlimited rail travel across Europe. And we did 13 countries in 30 days. It was amazing. Like the most amazing experience of, again, turning up to a city and just hoping that there was accommodation. And, uh, you, st and you said you stayed with people for like a dollar a night? That was after college. That was after. Okay. There we generally stayed in backpackers hostels, which were sort of $10 a night normally, sharing, sharing a room with seven or eight people. Okay. Or sleeping on the train, which was a good way of saving money. Right. So um, you, uh, after you finished your backpacking trip and you came back and you now had your, uh, your degree, your three-year degree that you had gotten, right? Yep. At what point, you know, or should I say, what did you do next that led you on the path that you went? Yeah. So whilst I was uh, living in Australia... After my Asia backpacking, I went to Australia and started working. Okay. I worked at a very large backpackers hostel in the centre of Sydney. Um, and just working in the bar there, which I was doing to earn, you know, earn a, a little bit of extra money, 
I realized how exciting it was working actually in accommodation because you had, obviously you had the, the rooms, but you also had a bar, a restaurant, cafe, travel shop, loads of stuff going on and just loads of people having fun. So when I got back, I got the opportunity to run uh, Backpackers Hostel in central London, um, sort of as a joint manager with someone uh, from my experience in Australia. And whilst I was running that, uh, it started to do really well in terms of its website and in terms of PR. We were starting to get a lot of articles in, in sort of magazines we shouldn't have got, partly due to I was being a bit cheeky, saying we were a little bit more than we were, uh, and partly because I was immersing myself in the industry, particularly the youth travel industry, trying to really understand what made both the guests, but also people wanting to write about the industry, tick. Um, I then realized... Um, very much around the, the, the London bombings when they, those occurred, is we didn't really actually suffer in terms of uh, going down in occupancy, whereas all the hotels completely uh, were decimated in terms of people just didn't want to come to London because of the fear. And what I found is that the youth travel market, the youth sector, is actually far more resilient to terrorist attacks and stuff like that because ultimately they have got the energy and the, the spunk really to, to fight against those sort of things. Um, and what I also noticed was that our demand generally around the year, apart from maybe corporate events in London, was stronger than a lot of the unbranded three-star hotels in our area. They were struggling. They were struggling to get business on their website. They were almost faceless hotels that had no energy about them, and therefore people would stay if they had to rather than because they chose to. So I then realized that there was a opportunity to, to brand the three-star hotel with a, with a brand that was about service, that was about value, it was about fun, and also maybe having a bit of a young person's edge, not in terms of necessarily attracting young people, but actually about attracting people with a young view of life or, or wanting stuff with a bit more energy. What do you so, think, of those, of those characteristics that you just mentioned, one of them was fun. Yeah. How important do you think that portion of the branding was? It was fun. It, I, I guess with, with, with Backpackers Hostels, your demographic is 18 to 30. The minute you're a three-star hotel, it's 18 plus anyone. And uh, I had to reel back what I really wanted to do a little bit because I realized the market can probably fit in. Um, but recent brands that have opened in Europe have actually shown that you can, you can be cheekier. Uh, with 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 hotel brands because, quite frankly, life life can be very dull if you stay in all, you know, the same same place all the time. Um, and I think the fun element was important both for the guests but also for the staff because I think if you enjoy and and, and uh, like where you work, um, it doesn't seem so much of a chore. Um, and hospitality sometimes can be uh, because it's quite a, a undervalued profession. Uh, I think in the States, but also here as well. Okay. So, um, so, so, we were, so I took over a hotel. Um, basically, I, the company that owned the Backpackers Hostel also had hotels. Uh, and because the hostel was doing quite well, they said, would you be interested in running our three-star hotel? The profits are stagnated. Is there something you can do? And I said, well, there is an idea, but I would like to put a new brand on the hotel um, and they said, well, what is it going to be? I said, well, I haven't come up with a name, but I've come up with a concept. I need a bit of money to, to go to a branding company. I don't need a big Saatchi and Saatchi branding company, just a small branding company that I see eye to eye with to do it. So they said, look, if it's not too expensive, you can do it. So I went about a branding process with a company called The Youth Conspiracy, and they, they'd specialised in working with large multinational brands to try and find out why young people weren't engaging with their brands and we were going to try and do it in the opposite manner whereby you actually created a brand that young people could engage with and felt connected with um, so I worked with them and we came up after about a two month period we started with a thousand names and we got it down to ten we then um, put it out to a community of people aged between 16 and 30 uh, there's about a thousand people asking what their views were, and they got it. We then got it down to two. Uh, I then checked what the trademark possibilities were, and if the letters meant something. Uh, and the two names were HQ and UMI, or UMI as it was. 
Uh, and once we searched, Umi actually meant ocean in Japanese. And because I wanted to create a hotel brand that connected cultures uh, and made it easy for anyone from anywhere to fill at home, that it actually fitted in perfectly. But it was by luck. It was just because the U, M, and I could interconnect, which is what I wanted. But then obviously the oceans connect, and it was it all made sense. Cool. Uh, we then chose the brand color blue, obviously because of the ocean. Uh, I support Liverpool. Uh, and they're red, and our biggest rivals wear blue. So it's quite an unusual decision from someone who's a Liverpool fan. But it really fitted in. Uh, and then uh, about a year later, we launched Umi London. Uh, it was May 31st, 2007, so almost six years ago. Um, and we've sort of gone from strength to th strength with the brand. Uh, we've worked with over 160 students in six years, um, ranging from 16-year-olds uh, wanting a week's work placement to year-long hospitality students. We currently have a marketing student uh, working with us from Arizona um, who's studying at the University of Rochester. Uh, and I've worked with actually about 25 or 30 American students who've come for work placements uh, to the UK. So it's, that's been a really big part of our brand to keep the young and fun part of it is actually having young people come through and, and work with us to come up with new ideas. Uh, let me ask you, because I'm, I'm, I, I apologize, but I feel a little bit confused. Is yep. is Yumi a physical hotel? Yes, it is. Yeah, we got one in London, we got one in Brighton, and we got one in Moscow. And we launched with the one in London in 2007. Uh, the year later, the same hotel operators saw the opportunity for a hotel in Brighton, and they wanted a brand on it, so they chose Yumi, which was great. And then a year later, I was approached via Facebook, bizarrely, uh, by a guy in Russia who happened to be an old schoolmate who was interested in our brand for a hotel they just opened in the center of Moscow. What do you That's, think makes the brand uh, uh, so successful? Very much it's about people. Uh, hospitality business businesses are generally about people because ultimately there's going to be a face-to-face -face contact at some point. I know a lot of stuff is done through the internet, but I think quality of service is really, really important. Um, I got a lot of inspiration because at the end of my backpacking trip, I actually went across America, uh, went across the States. Uh, I went to LA, Vegas, uh, Memphis, um, New Orleans, Chicago, and Miami. And some of the places... Not really the hotels, actually. Uh, the service was amazing. The hotels, what we found at the level we were staying, um, the service was pretty poor. I'm not going to mention the hotels, but um, okay. I was, you, go to, you went to the restaurants, and again, with the food side, when we were in Memphis, you know, went to some really great barbecue restaurants, and the staff were so friendly, and you know, we wanted to learn about how you know, they took us into the kitchen and showed us everything we wanted to do, whereas... Sometimes in the hotels, we're like, you know, what's cool to do in your city? And they just shrug their shoulders. And it felt like um, the more you pay, the better the service. And in my mind, service should be good no matter what price you're paying. Um, so that's really important because what that has allowed us to do is build a very loyal client base. Uh, secondly, I think it's, it's not um, country specific in terms of a brand. So certain hotel brands come across as either American or French or Spanish, and generally people from those countries prefer to, to stay there. Uh, in the last 30 days, I was having a look just before we, we, we connected via Skype, uh, the last 30 days, we've had about 35 different nationalities book at the hotel in London. You know, that's an international uh, hotel brand. Um, and I think we also make it really easy for people to book with us direct. Um, the online travel agent charges a very high commission, 20% um, plus per booking to the hotel. So for every booking you get direct, you're saving 20 to 25%. Uh, so we made sure that we did enough marketing and we made our systems and, and visuals easy enough for people to book no matter what device, no matter where they were. Uh, and even if they wanted to phone, that there's someone 24 hours a day to take a phone call in the hotel. So if the Yumi Hotels... Are physical hotels. Yep. And you started Yumi Digital. Yep. What is Yumi Digital in relationship to the Yumi Hotels? 
It's actually, a, it's, it's basically a separate business. Um, we set up the digital um, on the back of the hotels. When we launched in Moscow, um, because it was in Russia and because um, our relationship with our booking software provider uh, became a little difficult because they didn't see the vision that we had, um, we had to do, or I had to develop my own software for the hotels. Uh, when we went live with those, with that software, other hotels started contacting us saying who was a provider of that software. And I said, well, it's ours. And they said, well, could we use it? So I was like, oh, um, I guess so. We'll have to work up obviously an agreement out. And then the two hotels that first approached us both needed a new website because their website were terrible. I mean, there was no way they were going to get a booking through their website. So when I went and met them, it was actually far more than just a website. It was they wanted to know about social media. They didn't understand SEO. They just were very disconnected from what was happening in online travel. So whilst playing football, soccer, uh, with a friend of mine, we were training for a match. I asked him what he was doing. I went to college with him. And he said, I'm a freelance web designer. So I said, Shall we set up a, an agency specializing in the hotel and travel industry, providing great branding, great websites, and selling our software on? And so that was the very end of 2010, uh, sort of no, end of November 2010. And that was, that was Umi Digital. That's how it was created. So now we have clients uh, as far away as Barbados um, and uh, Ghana, where we've done websites or branding or help them create marketing strategies, but we only work within the hotel and travel sector. Um, we want to be niche. Uh, we work from backpackers hostels to luxury hotels, but we really, uh, we really focus on trying to um, help people within the industry to, to, to improve their digital uh, strategies and, and, and physical products. So where did you get the money to develop this uh booking software for the hotels well if you don't mind me asking yeah that's okay no well it wasn't actually that expensive to be honest um one of the things that we really made sure was we worked out what we were spending with a current company and the owners of the hotel said you're spending a lot of money in this company i said well if we can if you can give me a loan i'll pay this off within a year because i won't spend more than what we were spending with that company in a year in a year, and we, and we did. We actually paid it off in nine months. So um, that was almost a no-brainer. Um, where we are now is we, that was all you know, done by development house and everything else in the UK. Um, we now have, within Umi Digital, our own technology person who, who develops that and also develops our, our websites and everything else. But uh, yeah, the initial stages, I didn't really want to go crazy because ultimately when I was building it, it was build, being built for Umi not being built for other hotels. So when this was built for the UMI hotels, did you take ownership of this program under, yes. di under UMI Digital? Yes. Because you correct. paid it back? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. And what do you think makes it, that program that you wrote, different from maybe the other ones that might be out there being used by other hotels? I think um, I'm passionate about hospitality and tourism. Uh, I'm very passionate about hotels, obviously, in particular. And I wrote it from a hotelier's point of view, not from a travel agent, not from a software developer, not from some guy who's just good at systems. Uh, you know, we interviewed people within the hotels of what they would want. Uh, we asked guests what they wanted. Mm. Uh, and we looked at what the difficulties that we were having in terms of processes and seeing what we could do to make things easier. Um, ultimately, that was really that was at the core of what we wanted to do. And, and I didn't necessarily feel that that was the case. I also wanted it to be flexible. Um, I wanted to be able to change it as we were going along, um, which a lot of the uh, sort of general systems are not that flexible. It's this is the package, like it or lump it. Um, so yeah, it was, it, I think that's the sort of the three the three main things that we were we were trying to do. I mean, we're now progressing in terms of the software with with our with our CTO to really push push the technology side, you know, I had it as a sort of our system that we were sort of selling, but it wasn't, wasn't the main product. The main product digital sells is branding and websites and, and, and social media strategy. But 
you know, now this, we can see the opportunity for, for the smaller B&Bs, the smaller hotels to just be able to get online really easily and really cheaply uh, so they can start selling directly because the online travel agents are just getting more and more powerful. You know, the bigger they get, the more they can spend with Google, the harder it is for you to protect your name when, you, when you, someone searches for it. So, um, so yeah, we, we've made sure recently that the, it all works on mobile that we can theme it and, and, and change it even more than we used to be able to, uh, and also checking the speed and, and, and the usability of it um, constantly. Okay. So what is, like, as the founder and CEO of this business, um, what is an average day like in what you do and what you go through? Just <laughs> maybe to give me an idea. Yeah, it's it's like uh, Space Mountain at Disney World. Okay, lots of ups and downs. Um, I mean, I think the one thing about hospitality and travel, uh, even in a sort of a, uh, a role with more responsibility, it's very social. You're always going to be with people, whether it's on the phone, whether it's by email, or it's, whether it's your team. Um, I generally get into work uh, before eight a.m. Um, I take the train from home. It's pretty easy. If I can, I go and do a jog before I go to work because I love doing sports and having a 20, 30 minute jog in the morning really gives you energy for the rest of the day. Okay. Um, I like to have an hour. I, every, the rest of the team get in at nine. I like to have an hour on my own to check my emails, check my social media to see if I've met, missed anything. Read Twitter. I read a lot of blogs and, and, and things on Twitter to, to learn. Um, hmm. And I also like to play with things. So, um, particularly like when Facebook doesn't update or Twitter doesn't update, to see how it physically works to make sure that when we're giving advice to people, it's up to date. And what, um, what, so kind, that, of, what, what kind of advice are you most often dealing with and giving to other companies? It's generally strategy about getting direct business. Di uh, direct business. Yes, that directly through their website or through their phones or, you know, um, and, and the tools around that. So for me, social media is very big for travel uh, and, and hospitality um, and how you manage that in an effective way to actually harness that power to, to drive business direct. Do you feel the experience and the knowledge that you have um, can help uh, restaurants and, and hotel type of things outside of just the UK? I mean, can you work with hotels that are in the US and, and Australia and, and things like that? Is that? Definitely, a hundred percent. I think I think hospitality is now a very global business. I think there will be local niches uh, and, and you'd hope that the restaurant or manager, uh, restaurant manager or the hotel manager would actually understand those. But in terms of general direct business strategies, the internet is global, Google's glo global. You know, ultimately uh, the way things work are, are, are pretty pretty similar. So yeah, we have, we have clients in, in obviously the UK, uh, all across it. We have clients in Germany. Uh, we have had a client in Africa, uh, in Eastern Europe. We have obviously the hotel in Russia, but we also have a backpackers hospital in St. Petersburg. We're in, we've done some consultancy work for a hotel in Barbados, the oldest hotel in the Caribbean, which was amazing, and I got to go there. So that's a big perk of the job. And we're actually in talks with a company in San Francisco about designing and, and, and helping with a brand and uh, and, and website um, for their business, a travel business. Um, what they really love is, is British design, and we really try and make sure that we, 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 we promote that. Now, what when you get a new client, is it something that you are able to continue working with year after year, or is it only like for maybe a six-month to a year time that you might work with them and then they're done? I was just curious as to how long the relationship with a hotel that you get started with might last? It's, it, we're very flexible. Um, what I found out the hard way is that a lot of design companies and marketing companies tie you in for ridiculously long contracts that you don't really know what you're paying for. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't want that. I'd rather people want to work with us and if they work with us through a website project, which is normally two or three months, and we're really honest and transparent and get them involved, that yeah, we may come and do a strategy session three months later and they may want a website refresh a year later because they enjoyed the process so much with us. Um, what I found is I found a lot of the times that when I went through the website process with, with companies that afterwards I didn't want to work with them again because it was such a, a painful process. Um, but yeah, we've had clients for two, since we've started. 
where we've been advising and physically implementing strategies for them. Uh, and we've had one client that we've done three websites for them in Germany. Uh, we're not doing anything for them at the moment, but they suggested that we're going to do some further websites for them in other countries across Europe. So we're very flexible with that. I'd, I'd love to say that every client that we get lasts forever, uh, but I, I'm realistic to, to know that people do look around. But we try and be... Uh, we give access to our designers, to our clients. We give access to our CTO if, if they need technical advice. I'm always available by email or by phone. And we try and sort of have quite a, a service-related uh, environment, which I brought from the hotels, because I think it's really important. If they're in hospitality, they would want to promote good service, so why don't we do the same, same for them? Now, if somebody uh, is looking to... I guess I'm not going to try to get so close to the hospitality area, but if they wanted to create a niche and start yep. and start a similar type of business um, and find clients and so forth, um, what might you recommend to this, typically a young person who says, you know, I want to have a business and I want to have an online business to where I'm helping a niche of a specific type of company or businesses out there. What type of advice in getting started might you give to somebody if you had the opportunity to talk to a young person who wanted to start something like that? Okay. I, I'm fortunate enough to actually do quite a, uh, a bit of lecturing at universities and um, some at hotel uh, management schools, sometimes at business schools. And the students that I see that I believe would start their business are people who are generally passionate about what either they're studying or topics that I've talked about. Um, and they generally come up and ask questions and really want to learn more. I think, um, and it's a, it's a really cheesy saying, but you learn something new every day. And what, you stop doing that. What are some of the most common questions that the students come up and ask? Well, exactly what you said is, if I wanted to do a niche, what, what should I do? And for me, it's, you've got to be passionate about it. I'm really passionate about hospitality and tourism, and I don't mind working 20 hours a day talking about it or doing stuff with it. Because ultimately, when you have your own business, it's actually 24 hours a day, because when you fall asleep, you're thinking about it too. Yeah, we don't want to tell anybody that. Sorry? We don't want to tell anybody that it's a 24-hour business, because it's a little too much for a lot of people. Yeah, well, that's, then they shouldn't have their own business. You're absolutely so right. It ultimately, and, and you know, uh, it frustrates me sometimes with you know some some very very few young people's work ethic that we've we've had where they're like, oh, you know, eight hours is a long day. I'm like, well, <laughs> run a hotel and that that will take you to 20 hours without a shadow of a doubt. We're doing this on a Sunday. There was no question from you or I that we couldn't do it on Sunday. You right, know, right. Um, I played tennis for an hour this morning and I played football. A very very big match yesterday. I was very exhausted, but, you know, that's, that's what happens when you run your own show. Right. Um, but, yeah, to do that niche, I think you really need to be passionate about it. And you need to have some experience and understanding about what you're doing. Um, I know it's very difficult for young people because they often say, well, I can't get a job because I don't have enough experience, and how am I going to get enough experience if I don't get the job? Well, you can learn about it. You can do a work placement. There's a lot of ways of actually finding out what you really want to do, and I think, you know, there are so many niches now. Uh, there are so many different industries out there that I think if you can really follow something that you love uh, and generally could see yourself doing seven days a week, 365 days a year, because ultimately online is 24-7, then, then you, you, you give yourself a much better chance. And I think you, you should always educate yourself. I think that's really important. You know, when you get to college, university, uh, teaching changes from learn this to research about this project, you know, and that's where learning changes. And I think with work, you can follow that by, by reading. And I think stuff like Twitter is amazing for that because there's a lot of resource out there to really learn. And you now I, I found out something, I met a guy who has a new digital business uh, to do with hotels on Friday. And it's very much about customer satisfaction. And I said, your product's great. But I don't know how that's going to help me with my direct business. And that's what hotels want to know. And weirdly, Saturday morning when I was waiting to, to, uh, to go to football, uh, I looked on LinkedIn and there was an article about how TripAdvisor influences the, the way that people book. So I sent it to him and he, he's now got his press release in an article. 
because that's that's it. But that's that connection, that education, you know, and, and also sort of education transfer, which I think is really important. What are the, some of the uh, things that you love about this particular industry that you're working in? What are the, what are, just pick out some nuggets for me of things that I love this and I love this and I love that. I, uh, I love working with people. Uh, I, I think that that's what's, it's great. It's great sitting down in other people's businesses and not always hearing their problems, but hearing where they want to go, you know, and seeing if you can come up with strategies to help them. And then when you explain it, that they actually understand it and implement it. We do some management of, or implementation of strategies, but what we often do is work with key stakeholders in the hotels or restaurants and educate them to do it themselves. And when they start doing that, it really works. It's really, it's great. It's great satisfaction. But why, um, why this niche? The market, well, you know, why, well, the reason for the niche, the, the niche uh, of hospitality and tourism is because I've worked in it and I love it. Okay. The, the, the marketing side is how we manage to get a brand to go from 0% direct business to 40% in a time where hotels are having the opposite experience. So, you know, and, and I, enjoy, I, I enjoy learning. You know, I think digital strategy is really exciting. I'm not a geek in terms of the internet, but uh, I like researching things. I think the way that Google does stuff is, is actually fairly simple if you, if you read what they say uh, and you try not to cheat the system. Because like with anything, whether it's, whether it's Lance Armstrong or anyone, if you cheat the system, you're going to get caught eventually. And that's why with the various Google updates, a lot of websites got knocked out because they were buying links for 15 years or 10 years. And ultimately, they got blacklisted. Right. So um, you don't want that. Um, I think the other thing that's really cool is that by having this uh, creative side is as much as I'm creative when I cook and I can't draw, I can actually work with designers to create really cool things for clients. And when they see something really cool and they go, wow, that's amazing, I'm really proud of it, you feel really proud that they're happy. Uh, and that goes back down to my roots of hospitality because ultimately when I cooked and the, the dish was great and they say compliments to the chef, it gives you a buzz. And it's the same thing when you have a digital client that loves what you, you, know, that loves what you produce for them. If you were able to uh, be sitting in front of a young person, you know, maybe 16, 17, and they thought they liked the industry that you're in, this travel and tourism, and they, yeah. and they wanted to do something similar, maybe a little bit of a different twist, um, and they said, you know, what are some of the, the challenges that I might face? You know, what, what are some of the negative things that I'm going to have to deal with? Uh, in building that business and getting it started, what would they m look like? I think um, one of the difficulties that I found at the beginning was was giving away information for free, helping a lot of people to try and get contracts, and you help them, and then they went with someone else. That's that's a bit of a bitter pill to swallow. Um, I think what a lot of companies do is they go out too cheap to start with in terms of their costs, and they make a loss on their initial products but what's tough is then to then get your prices up um so it's about really being more confident in terms of understanding that and i think if you're 16 or 17 and you want to go and travel and tourism travel you know travel out of the states get a passport go to south america go to australia go somewhere with a different culture to, to the, the american culture and the way that you see the industry the way that you see yourself the way that you see the world will be completely different and you know, the, the student working for us at the moment from Arizona, she literally does not want to leave London now. Her parents are actually worried um, because she just loved it so much. And she's, you know, excellent female soccer player, really loved university, you know, everything going well for her, but she's coming here and she loves the fact that every month she goes somewhere different, you know, different country, different culture. She's been to Berlin, Amsterdam, Dublin. You know, she's traveled around a bit. She's got involved with London life. She, you know, she really feels almost like a, a sort of a, a, a Londoner, a little Londoner. So I think that's, that's really important um, to immerse yourself in that industry. Um, I, I also think uh, another difficulty is, is, is making sure you know where you want to go. Um, a lot of people, when they set up businesses, when they're young and they're trying to do something in the digital sector, they're like, well, you know, I want to sell out like Facebook, you know, um, 
You yeah. don't actually have to do that if you don't want. You don't have to sell out to big investors. Uh, you can actually just run a really good business for a while, for a long time, growing it at the pace that you want to grow it whilst you have the standard of life that you want. Um, and that's quite good to have in your head because it doesn't. Ha you don't have to be a billionaire to be happy. You know, you can actually run a really successful business locally. And sometimes the local barbecue joint that doesn't expand to five or ten, or is actually more more successful financially than the ones that have gone to five or ten because the added cost of growing that big. Um, we actually started growing at a, a bit of a pace, and then I realised that we didn't have quite enough business for what number of staff we had so we've reduced it back down again and rather than having lots of staff on the junior level we've got a few staff who are senior and we will bring people in when we need it and i think you know it's controlling that which is which is kind of tough because you get on this whole exciting roller coaster and you're like oh we need more tea right right actually sometimes you don't <laughs> yeah it sounds great to have a junior designer but actually the head designer could do it himself now how many Full-time people, if any, do you have working for your company? Yeah, so only digital, we have four full-time, including, including myself. We have one part-time accountant who comes in once or twice a week. And we have, at, currently we have four interns, um, one from Holland, one from China, one from the States, and one from uh, the, the, uh, Denmark. Um, or doing different projects, or working with us on, on, on different things. And we also have a pool of part-time staff that come, come in on a casual basis, both from a design sense and also from a technology sense. So the interns, do they work remotely in their country, or do they come to London? They're in London, yeah. Really? In London. Yes, really cool. And do they pay their own way to live in London and work with you? Uh, uh, so it depends on where they've come from, uh, because that, the visas are dependent on certain stipulations. If they're European, that we pay them. Uh, the, the ones from the States are not allowed to be paid because of the visas, but they only work for us two days a week. Uh, and they'll often come, and they also study at the same time. So they study three days and work two days. Very interesting. Yeah. And they get a lot out of this. Yeah, we've had some people become really successful. I mean, one guy, set up, one guy who worked for me from the Netherlands has, has now set up a, a Groupon-style business in the Netherlands, and Groupon have tried to buy him because he's got so big. He's got 90% penetration in two or three of the cities in the Netherlands. So um, it's called Social Deal, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, we're, we're connected with a lot of the students still. How useful of a time do you think it was when you took that year off before you went to, you know, to the university? Do you think that that's something that you would highly recommend to young people or only in certain circumstances? What's your thoughts on that? Um, I, I'd highly recommend it. Um, I, I, I took a year out before and a year out afterwards because I realized that once I started working, it'd be very, very difficult to get the opportunity to take the time off. Um, when I... Before university, it really allowed me to, to get confidence in my own ability. I didn't do very well at high school. I did very well in my GCSEs, and then, uh, unfortunately, my parents divorced when I was 16, and I looked after my mother for two years. And sport and my mother were pretty much the most important things, not even girls at the time. So, you know, that was it. And I was, you know, a bit of a late bloomer when it came, came to the social side because I was playing sport the whole time. So I think that year out allowed me to mature as a person and allowed me to travel, which allowed me to mature even quicker. So when I got to university, some people thought I was even older than, than 19 uh, and when everyone else was 18 because I'd, I'd done stuff. Um, it also made me realize how much I loved learning because my grades weren't that good. I felt, I felt stupid. I didn't feel like I could learn you know uh, and then when I actually went to university and I was doing stuff that I really enjoyed uh, you know I trained as a chef as well at university which was really exciting that I felt a bit more confident about myself which meant when I left university or I needed jobs in the summer that I could get the jobs I wanted because I had that confidence. Do you think that when you go talk to a new client a new hotel um, do you does it ever come up the fact that you have a degree in the, in the hospitality and tourism, that they give you more respect because of that? Or do you think it has absolutely nothing to do with anything? Um, 
I think it depends. If, if the people I'm talking to have done a hotel management degree or a hospitality degree, they find it really interesting and you sort of have, you know, we're in the club together sort of thing. Um, I think the fact that I've learned and I've worked, basically when you're, when you're studying hospitality, you're almost working in it because you're doing a lot of practical experience as well. Well, I, I did anyway. That in theory, you know, I'm 32 and I've been working in hospitality since I'm 18. 14 years experience. It's got a long time. Um, so that level of experience for people is, is actually quite um, comforting. Uh, even though I, I occasionally turn up for, for meetings with jeans on, um, you know, and I, I'm probably younger than a lot of people do what I do. Um, the fact that I've, I've immersed myself in the industry, whether from university or, or, or going forwards is I think really important. Um, I, I think for me it's important because I learned a lot when I studied. I think it's helped me a lot in terms of strategizing, in terms of creating proposals and making sure that they flow uh, and various things like that. I think that's really important. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think if it came to the crunch uh, they would sign a contract just because I had a hospitality degree. I don't think they would. Um, but I think we probably get contracts that we may not have done uh, because of the knowledge I have of the industry, partly from my hospitality degree, but partly from experience. So to do what you're doing, would you say you don't need, absolutely, you don't need a degree from a university or you really do? I, I, you don't necessarily need a hospitality degree. I mean, I, I know it's very expensive to go to college. It's, it's expensive here now, it's even more expensive over there. Um, and I think, you know, if you can have a year out and choose what you really want to do and make sure that you're studying something you're really passionate about, it will make a huge difference. Um, you know, if you did business management and then went into hospitality, that's fine. If you did you know, digital marketing or marketing, that would be fine. You know, a lot of the American students don't do hospitality who work for us. They're generally business or marketing Majors. So it wouldn't necessarily matter that they had the degree for the niche or the niche that they were going into. No, no, no. That's that's definitely not a necessity. Um, okay. You know, people. You know, if you study general business and you enjoy it, uh, it's sometimes easier to relate it to a topic that you're really interested in, whether it's sports or travel or food or romance or you know whatever you know there, there, there's 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 a lot of opportunity but it's it's about as i said it's that you know if you're passionate about business that's great but then try and hone in on something that you're a topic that you're really focused and, and passionate about okay um aside from the questions that i've asked and that you've uh, shared so far is there anything that maybe any final comments or thoughts that you would want to uh, leave us with and add um I, I guess it's, it, it, it sounds a little cheesy, but um, I support Liverpool Football Club. We, were, we are a great club, but we've had a, some difficult years recently. Uh, and in the 50s, we were in the division below the top division. And we, uh, we, we employed this manager from Scotland. And he was the first sort of British manager who started coming out with, with phrases that really inspired people. Um, he even went to the extent of changing our kit from red and white to all red because he said a, one colour makes you look bigger and stronger when you, when you go out on the pitch. But one of the things that's very tough, I think, for young people at the moment is, is believing in yourself. And you hear a lot of negative press, particularly in the UK, about how young people are doing drugs and young people are doing this and young people are doing that. And, you know, I, for myself, love employing young people because it, it gives me energy and it gives me new ideas. So I think it's important to have confidence. But Bill Shankly was the manager's name, and he came up with a saying, which was, believe you are the best, and then make sure you are. And that's something that I always say to young people, like, really believe in yourself, because if you believe in yourself and you're willing to work hard, you'll make it. Um, but if you, if you don't want to work hard and you, you don't believe in yourself, and whatever tools can help you believe in yourself, whether it's traveling, whether it's extra learning, whether it's just being passionate about it, um, it can really help the way that you go whether it's your own business or, or being successful in someone else's all right well steve thank you very much for you know sharing your time with uh, what should i be to uh, provide this interview um we may have you back at some point in the future uh, to just check up on your career and and the business but i think a lot of the information was very useful and i thank you again 
It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.